Boy, that smells wonderful. I'd forgotten how coffee smells. This is incredible. You can drink it, too. I was never actually allowed to stop and have a cup of coffee before. This is quite a treat. Wow. This smells incredible, Tess. Honey, will you wake up and stop smelling the coffee? Colombian Supremo at 4.22. French roast. 4.16. Ooh, something freeze-dried at 4.01. How come people don't make cappuccinos in the morning, Tess? They gotta go to work, honey. They don't have time. <laughs> no! Why can't the guys just meet me there? It's too early. What do you mean? It's only seven. Why do they do it, Tess? They invent clocks, and then they become slaves to them. They make up little jobs and then they become prisoners to them. They, they build all sorts of roads going nowhere and they spend all their time going up and down and back and forth. And sometimes, you know, I could just shake them. Well, in a nice way, I mean, of course. You've been hitting that coffee a little too hard lately, huh? No. Tess met hate with hate back there. See, that's what he wants. Who? I heard that you make a great cup of coffee. Ah, well, it's one of the few joys of taking human form, decaf mocha latte, but I'm afraid there isn't a cappuccino machine here. Hmm. Let's see what I can do. So let's go back to what we read through last week, uh, but we'll continue on. Uh, well, we won't actually. Uh, uh, yeah, we will. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through, through whom he also made the universe. And so we noticed last week the various ways that God has spoken, and the first one was uh, that we noticed anyway was angels to Abraham. He actually spoke directly uh, before uh, the instances that we see of the angels, but he also spoke through the burning bush to Moses. He spoke through Samuel's ghost to King Saul. He actually spoke through handwriting on a wall once. He spoke through Balaam's donkey, my favorite. Uh, but also, if we had only one time that he spoke, you know, we would re realize, uh, I mean, we would only see a, a certain aspect of God. And that's why it's very important that Jesus finally came uh, and was the full representation of his being because if we only saw one time that he spoke we could see that he was we could think of him as demanding or harsh or vague or or jealous or unforgiving um, or we could go the other way and think of him as being just merciful and tolerant and blind to faults and generous to the ungrateful and patient and think that we can just get by with whatever uh, we want to do okay well um, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Now Hebrews is going to say more about angels than any other book that we have talking about about angels. Angels are mentioned all through the Bible, but Hebrews makes a little bit more of a point of their place in the order of things, but especially about Jesus being superior to them. For, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says he makes his angel spirits uh, and his servants flames of fire. But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, 
You laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that you, we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at the present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus. who was made lower than the angels for a little while now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. What do you believe about angels? I mean, what, you know, does just you assume or do you think was taught? What do you believe? Do you believe that they are active behind the scenes constantly? Or maybe even interacting directly with us like in Touched by an Angel in human form uh, and we just don't know that they're angels? Do you believe that you have a personal guardian angel? Uh, if so, does everyone have one or just followers of Jesus? Uh, what are the limits of their ability to guard us if we have guardian angels? Are some weaker in their ability or, or so that those who have tragedies in their lives, you know, have just weaker guardian angels, and that's why the tragedy occurs. Does that explain the evil and misfortune in our world? When we think about it, there are some things we learn about angels from the Bible. But the Bible actually doesn't have any teaching about angels. Uh, this passage may be the closest to teaching about angels that we have. Everything else about angels is appearances and actions that have little explanation, if any explanation at all. So since I brought up the idea of guardian angels, where does that come from? Uh, well, it has little or nothing to do with Hebrews, but it actually comes from something Jesus said. It actually is in the context of an answer Jesus is giving when his followers asked him, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's in Matthew 18, and he has a little child come to him, and he tells them that whoever takes the position of the little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that there are angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. So that comes, you know, sounds a little bit, at least a little bit like the little children each have an angel in heaven. Uh, but it doesn't say that exactly. Uh, but he's also included all of those who believe in him, right? Well, the first appearance of an angel in the Bible is the angel of the Lord in Genesis 16, when Abram's wife, it's before he's called Abraham, uh, Sarai, before she was called Sarah, was mad at her servant Hagar, and Hagar was on the run. And the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water and told her that she was pregnant and that she would have a son whose descendants would be too numerous to count. And that was good in, you know, in most people's minds. But he also said he would be a wild donkey of a man. <laughs> and his hand would be against everyone and everyone's hand would be against him. Well, not so good. 
Uh, but he did send Hagar back uh, to Sarai and, you know, told her that, you know, she would be protected. But the first appearance of any angel, uh, but one, this first appearance of the, any angel, but one called the angel of the Lord, is where we get the idea that the angel of the Lord is the part of God who became Jesus. And if God consists of three parts in one, the Father, the Son, and, and the, the Holy Spirit, then the Son and the Spirit have always existed just like the Father. Right? And so here's the idea that one article, I'm just going to read from this article uh, as, as it makes the argument. Notice a few things in Hagar's story. First, the angel of the Lord tells Hagar that he will greatly multiply your descendants. That he will greatly multiply your descendants. An ordinary angel cannot do that. For only the Lord God can give life. And also this statement is very similar to what God told Abraham. Okay. Second, the angel of the Lord knew Hagar was with child. That the angel was a son and that he would be the only God. Uh, or, or, and that what he would be like. And he says only, only God is omniscient to know the future. Um, and so no ordinary angel could have known all that. Uh, that's kind of a weak argument because God could have told the angel that. But third, the angel says, the Lord has given heed to your affliction uh, when it was actually the angel of the Lord uh, in the wording of it who had given heed. And then finally in verse 13, the text says, the name of the Lord who spoke to her, clearly indicating that Hagar was speaking to God. Uh, in this writer's opinion. Furthermore, Hagar calls the angel God and can't believe that she remained alive after seeing him. Uh, and indeed, the word beer, lahai, roy, means well of the living one seeing me. So, maybe the most interesting thing to notice uh, is that although an angel of the Lord appears in the New Testament, the, that term, an angel of the Lord, uh, more than once, there's no mention of the angel of the Lord. And so the idea is that the Son of God is here in human form, you know, while he's on the earth, rather than angelic form. And so it's not going to talk about the angel of the Lord because Jesus uh, was that same being. Well, I do think that there's something to this idea, but there are also a few problems with it that should make us cautious about acting like we really know that this is a plain and simple reality, that the angel of the Lord is Jesus. First of all, if God wanted us to have a clear understanding of this, he could have told us, and he didn't. That doesn't mean it's completely wrong, but it's possible that it's not that simple. Maybe uh, what comes out as the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament sometimes is really just an angel of the Lord, uh, and so you shouldn't always think that that's Jesus, but sometimes it is, or usually it is. But one place where I don't want it to be the personality uh, in the Old Testament who will become Jesus uh, in the New Testament is this one. Let me, let's look at that. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew, and he returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Now, I know that we must remain humble and acknowledge that God is both merciful and just, even when we can't see both aspects of his nature. Uh, but I just can't quite wrap my head around this being the same personality that we see during Jesus' ministry. But let's put that aside for now and consider one more thing that would be most puzzling. And that is about half of the times that angels are mentioned in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is the description that's used. Uh, and so here, where Jesus in Hebrews is being shown to be superior to the angels, the Hebrew writer doesn't say that Jesus is superior to all of the angels except the angel of the Lord, uh, since that is who he actually is. And so that leads me to believe that this idea was, uh, and not an idea during the New Testament era. In other words, Christians in the New Testament era didn't necessarily think that the angel of the Lord mentions in the Old Testament were Jesus. Uh, because of the way that it's worded here. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's completely wrong. But it probably does mean that we shouldn't let that idea get in the way of the point that's being made in Hebrews. 
The point is that Jesus is superior to the angels, not most of the angels or all the angels, but one. He is superior to all of the angels. But why is it necessary or helpful to make this point for the first readers of this letter? Why does the Hebrews writer think that this is so important? We don't have it in any of Paul's letters. He doesn't talk about Jesus' superiority to the angels at all. Uh, and I've never actually known of anyone who wanted to worship angels or thought that Jesus was not superior to angels. Well, one reason that we don't see this much, if at all, is because of this passage, maybe. Because a lot of people have read this, and so they know. You know, it's kind of hard to miss the point. Jesus is superior to the angels. However, we don't actually see much about angel worship in the New Testament era. And so why would it be important to say don't worship the angels in essence, uh, as we're seeing here? There is one passage, however, in Colossians that mentions the worship of angels. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. You remember that terminology from last week? The shadow versus the reality. Jesus is the reality. All of the other religious stuff in the Old Testament was a shadow. Uh, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. So it's just thrown out there. We don't know anything about what they were doing, who was worshiping angels or why. Uh, but it's mentioned and it's interesting that we see the shadow of things that were to come here uh, as well as uh, in Hebrews. Now the only thing that we can know is that most Jew, Jews, except for the Sadducees, had a strong belief in angels. And Greeks and Romans also believed in angels, even though they just called them demons. There were good demons and bad demons. There were good angels and bad angels. Uh, but they didn't believe that they served only one God, and so you know there could be angels that were serving all of the, the various gods in their pantheon. But Hebrews is written more to the Jewish perspective than any other perspective. So let's look at one instance that helps us see how important angels were in the minds of most Jews. It's near the end of the book of Acts. It's after Paul has become a very controversial person in Jewish circles, and he goes back to Jerusalem. He had been a Pharisee, and he had opposed all of the followers of Jesus to the point of persecution and execution. He had been chosen by Jesus, though, personally, to not only stop persecuting Jesus' followers himself, but to take the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles, to all of the non-Jews. Well, during his ministry, Paul has gone into synagogues all over the Roman Empire, Jewish synagogues, and preached about Jesus for as long as they would listen. But then eventually most of them had turned against him, and especially when he get to the issue of Gentiles who wanted to follow Jesus. Uh, and they all thought, or they thought that he should say that they would have to become Jews first in order to be loved by God. Well, for many years he's been causing trouble all over the world from their perspective by saying that everyone, whether Jews or Gentiles, everyone is saved by their faith in Jesus, having nothing to do with circumcision or the law. Now he's returned to Jerusalem, and everybody knows who he is. They don't necessarily know what he looks like, but his enemies have managed to get him arrested. And they want him to be executed. But Paul is entitled to a trial, uh, and the first trial is in the same court that demanded that Jesus be crucified, called the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court. This doesn't look good for Paul. So his enemies hate him so much that 40 of them later will actually take an oath not to eat or drink anything until they have killed Paul. That's how much Paul is hated by his enemies. But before that, he gets into the Sanhedrin, the, the high court, the Jewish high court, and this is how he turns them against each other. He knows them and he knows how to do this. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee. Descended from Pharisees, I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Now the Sadducees, they were in power, but they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in angels or spirits. So there was this controversy. 
When he said this, a dispute broke out between Pharisees, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits. But the Pharisees believe in all these things. There was a great uproar and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? Think about this. Uh, if a Jew did not believe in Jesus and there were no prophets like the Old Testament prophets like Elijah around, then what would be the highest authority that might appear in their minds, in their understanding? Well, angels could be among them at any time without being recognized. I mean, most of the time they look just like men. At any given moment, they needed to be prepared to humble themselves when an angel was revealed and might bring a message from God. This was in their Jewish history. If they didn't know the Son of God, angels would be the highest spiritual beings that they believed in. And so the writer of Hebrews knows the minds of the Hebrew people. And so he knows how crucial this issue is for them. The angel of the Lord spoke to Moses from the burning bush. They also believed the law was given through angels. It was actually Stephen, uh, the first Christian who was killed for being a follower of Jesus, who spoke to the same Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin, this is way before Paul is appearing before them. Uh, it was before he was a follower of Jesus, in fact, because he is there approving of Stephen's eventual death. Listen to what he said, especially the last line. This is Stephen speaking. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who per predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. The Old Testament never said it explicitly like that, but Stephen said it. They believed it. The Pharisees did. But Paul was there, known as Saul at that time, although, uh, and he may have even been a member of the Sanhedrin, because at one point he said he cast his vote uh, against Stephen. But in any case, he became a committed persecutor who approved of Stephen's brutal and actually illegal execution. They didn't have the right, the Jews, to execute uh, anyone. And they executed by stoning, which was very brutal. Well, the role of angels in Jewish history and the Jewish religion was not a side note. This was not just you know, something that was mentioned from time to time in their minds. The role of angels was as close to a central issue as it could be. I don't think it was a central issue, but it was as close to a central issue as it could be. The point is, if Jesus is higher than the angels, he is higher than any other power or authority in their understanding. Now, let's remind ourselves of the problem and the solution. Uh, these first readers of Hebrews were seeing all sorts of bad things happening around them, horrible things, persecution of all kinds, happening around them and to them, and it seemed like everything was only getting worse. When they became Christians, they kind of expected things to get better. You know, they actually expected Jesus to return in their lifetime and establish this earthly kingdom. And so this just doesn't seem like what they signed on to at all. Things just don't look right. Question, what are we seeing in our world today? You know, I could easily list a lot of problems in our world today that could be taken as evidence that things are only getting worse. Now, I could make a case that some things are getting better, but... You know, I think a lot of us think that things are mostly just getting worse. But I'm, I'm just going to pause, actually, and let you create your own list. Because we all see different things. So include the things in your list that you thought would be different in your life if you did the right things. How's it all working out for you? Is it better than you thought it would be? Or worse than you thought it would be? 
um, make that, is it better than you think it should be? Or worse than you think it should be? So think about that for just a minute. Now, maybe you're a glass half full person, okay? And you do see the blessings in your life as vastly overshadowing the disappointments and failures and griefs. Um, when Brenda and I stopped to visit with Joyce a couple of weeks ago, she was telling me what a wonderful life she's had. And that's great. But she was also saying that in contrast to a sister in Christ who had a very difficult life. So I'm guessing that even if you do feel that your life is blessed, you also see the evil in the world and the difficulties in the lives of so many children and helpless people. So what's the solution? Is there a solution that's bigger than the problem? Uh, is there a solution that's bigger than all of the problems? How do we live in this world of darkness without losing hope and giving up? How can we see goodness and light in spite of it all? Well, the solution is the Hebrew writer puts it is look at Jesus. Look back at verses 6, 7, and 8 of chapter 2. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made him a little dim, a little lower than the angels, and you crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. And in putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. I believe that this is the them is a plural. It's not just Jesus. It's talking about the faithful followers of Jesus. That's us, hopefully. <laughs> and then there's the problem. You know, in putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. So what's the solution? But we do see Jesus. That's the very next line. But we do see Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father, there are so many things that are so much bigger than us that we do not understand. We don't understand much about angels. Uh, we do trust that there are angels that are working in our behalf just as angels were working in Jesus' behalf and came and attended to Him even after His temptation when Satan was doing his best to try to destroy the whole plan that You had for us. But Father, we thank You most of all that Jesus did uh, come through all of that, that he, even in the garden, when he prayed that he would not have to go through what he went through, that, that Satan was wanting him to go through and was hoping would actually bring about a victory on his part instead of on your part, uh, that Jesus went through it and that then he was raised from the dead, that he showed that his power surpassed by far the power of any other uh, evil spirits or angels in this world or in existence anywhere. Father, help us to trust you that all of the things that we see that are bad are not all of what is really going on and certainly not all of how it will end up. Father, help us to look at Jesus every day so that we do not get uh, discouraged and disappointed. We pray these things in his name.